All right, guys, let's get Mr. Annie's take on ReZero Season 3 Episode 5 cut content. Subaru versus Lust. Why she's the most evil Archbishop so far. I think that um, in terms of specifying why she's the most evil, I think Echidna had a pretty good one of like literally stripping away someone's humanity. Like, like they, she turns people into actual fucking insects. The absolute like cruelty and the sadistic nature that she has. The way that she even talks to other people, I could definitely say she is the most evil Archbishop so far. Capella might just be the most twisted Archbishop Subaru's faced yet. On top of her sadistic desire to be- I don't know, I don't know about twisted. Betrugus was very, very twisted, but I wouldn't say Betrugus is like more evil than Capella. Loved by everyone, her psychotic behavior won't even allow Subaru to reset. It's a new challenge making it seem increasing- What? Behavior won't even allow Subaru to reset. Won't even allow Subaru to reset? What do you mean? It's a new challenge making it seem increasing- Like how she won't kill him. Yeah. The fact that, like, I think some people were confused about, like, how the fuck does Subaru even survive against Capella? There's no way he is that, like, good at fighting to even be alive. But Capella did specifically say, like, I could never kill you. No, no, no. I don't, I don't want to kill you. Far from it, right? Her definition of love prevents her from killing Subaru. Instead, she'd rather turn him into a fucking worm. Seemingly likely, whatever happens in this loop might just end up being permanent. Yes. Subaru's encounter with Gluttony isn't to be overlooked either, but a large portion of this video will focus on her. Yeah, I uh, and Julius right now is still fighting Roy, so that's still worrisome. Um, do you think that we're gonna get a checkpoint after losing a leg? Cause. The way that the episode was progressing after Subaru was drowning, you would think that he would just die. But because more pieces on the map were moving in terms of like Reinhardt and Capella's extra, you know, um, what's it, her demand, right? So many different things are still moving where I feel like it's not going to reset. But that doesn't mean that we're going to be permanently legless. Maybe we're going to keep going in this run, but we will reset and, you know, checkpoint will be still when he wakes up with Felix saving everybody, or we do make a checkpoint, a crazy one, where a leg is gone permanently, which would be really cool because the connections is Al, the parallels. Al doesn't have a left arm, Subaru doesn't have a right leg, you know? We're basically kind of like, obviously it's not the same, but the fact that Al could be Subaru from a different timeline and shit, it's just like more little connections and little, you know, cool things to compare the two. Some people are saying Satala would never allow the person that she loves so much to be in this much pain and, you know, uh, well, not, not that much in pain, but like to lose a literal leg and continue with that. I don't know. It would be really ballsy to make a checkpoint after the events of last episode. The Sin Archbishop of Lust, Capella Amarada Logunica. I'll properly explain the full extent of her abilities, along with the raw, uncut logic behind why she does what she does. It's a bit more than just wanting to be loved by everyone. So let's take a look at this crazy episode of ReZero and see exactly what it is the anime left out from it. Let's go. But first, before we get started. All right. I know you know who this iconic bunny girl is. So Are you motherfucker? You switched it up. That's not fair. You've never done an ad read like that. I knew you were going to do an ad, but you fucking switched it up. God damn. Yo, didn't the kid not also have an Arknights ad? He did, right? Yo, these dudes are all getting fucking Arknight sponsor shit. What the fuck? Right? Download your fucking code. Yeah, yeah, it's the same fucking sponsor. We getting hit with the same fucking goddamn Arknight sponsor. But hey, here's the link. Here it is. Guys, there's a link. Discount code. Sorry, I mean discount code. You gotta, I think you have to download the app using that link. And then that, that's like extra counters. Or whatever threshold or goal that he, you know, the uh, contract is, and then Andy News gets paid out more that you use that code. There it is. New six star operator. Yeah, 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 yeah. Chapter five, Muddy Stream, covering chapter five from volume seventeen of the light novel and chapter one from volume eighteen. To start with Gluttony's unexpected arrival, as soon as Subaru knew it was him, he wasted no time unleashing the fastest and strongest whip attack he'd ever produced. In <laughs> and it didn't do anything. Roy just fucking bit it. I was like, yo, I'm surprised that the whip didn't get cut when Roy bit it with the sharp teeth, but technically, the whip is made with a guilty low material, so I'm sure it's very durable. Attack he'd ever produced. In fact, 
This was without a doubt the greatest blow Subaru had ever mustered in his entire life. The impact would have gouged out skin and flesh alike, but somehow Roy managed to catch it effortlessly. Too easy. Krush had engaged just like we saw next, but in addition to those invisible slashes of wind, she also followed it up with a close range sword thrust. Okay. It was a charge that seemed sure to impale the target in front of her, but once again, Roy had avoided it like it was nothing. They're really good at martial arts. Lie, Roy, melee combat, they're so- I mean, he's literally 1 v 3 right now. With an inhuman display of acrobatics, Roy twisted his body in a way that shouldn't have been possible, then deflected Krush's blade with only his fingertips. Bruh. It was a counter only made possible by his concealed weapons known as the Tiger Claws. <laughs> Basically, the little, uh, you know, claws that he has as- Seemingly fingernails, right? And Lai has, like, he has three daggers that's, like, wrapped around his wrist to make it look like Wolverine claws. The purple extensions we see him wearing on each of his fingers here. He would then go for a counterattack on Krush, which actually would have hit had Subaru not moved her out of the way with his whip. Clutch? With him literally carrying her again now, Subaru would run away, serving as the decoy for Gluttony to give chase after. Moments like this is when the whip really comes to, uh... It, 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 you get to see really the impact of it. It's like, I'm not expecting the whip to like one shot an opponent or like do significant damage, but I expect it to help in utility and support and being able to maneuver like that. That's that's pretty fucking good. Boy, for gluttony to give chase after. This in turn created an opening for Julius, allowing him to land a direct hit on gluttony. Unfortunately, drawing a little blood wouldn't be enough to stop him, as by the time Julius had prepared his next attack, Roy was already on his feet, moving again. So even with Julius pressing the attack with a relentless fury of sword strikes, Roy's feral movements were just too hard to keep up with. As we saw in the anime though, it didn't matter if Julius could land a hit or not, so long as Roy was occupied, Krush and Subaru could go achieve their primary goal. That was easier said than done though, since for both Subaru and Krush, Ignoring gluttony was incredibly difficult. True. I mean, he was the singular goal Subaru had been- But this is not the same gluttony. And I don't even know if, you know, defeating this guy is going to do anything with Rem. Who knows? And I think that he might have a different authority entirely, even if it's authority of gluttony. Like, I, I, I don't- we haven't seen anything yet. And since, you know, there is pretty, pretty much almost confirmed that there are three brothers. It's not even brothers. They have different last names, but maybe they have different baby daddies. But, you know, White Whale, Lie. Hydra, Roy, and then there's gonna be someone else that probably matches the Great Rabbit, like, will defeating him even, like, return Rem's memories and shit? I have no clue. Pursuing for the past year. Time and time again, he'd dreamt of getting the chance to confront Gluttony like this, but now that that chance was finally here, he wasn't even able to stick around for it. It was an awful feeling knowing he'd have to let such an opportunity slip through his fingers like this. To Subaru, this is the first time making uh, contact with Gluttony though, right? He's never met Lai before. He has no clue. Even though he introduces himself as Roy Alford, I wonder, like, does he even know that the other one was named Lai Batinkaitos? Probably not. This. What had helped him to get over it was the extremely powerful look of conviction Krush gave him while he was contemplating it. It had reminded Subaru that he wasn't the only one affected by gluttony. As someone who personally had her memory stolen by him, she too knew the key to getting her old self back was standing right in front of them. And there might be even way more people impacted by it too, because, yeah, the memory loss is a thing, but the name loss, when you get your name eaten, only Subaru knows, because he has a connection with the witches. No one else, right? Nobody, nobody knows what the fuck Rem is. So let's take into account countless other people whose names probably has also been erased that could be returned if we defeats Gluttony. Even so, the choice she needed to make was clear. Fulfilling her duty would always come before helping herself. Even if it meant continuing to live in a world that was blank when it shouldn't be, that was a price she was willing to pay if it meant helping the people. Giga so, as much as their hesitation, reluctance, and regrets encouraged them otherwise, Subaru and Krush knew they both lacked the time and strength to defeat Roy right now. They knew the only right choice was to pursue their true target. So, it was upon crashing into Capella's base of operations that the first thing Subaru would notice would be the media. It was the most peculiar one he'd seen to date. It's pretty As cool. As a device that expanded and enhanced the user's voice, 
The fact it was shaped like some kind of pipe organ, organ really intrigued Subaru more than it should have. Yeah, it looked like some sort of like pipe organ that Shadow from Eminence in Shadow would start playing at a church. It was a machine solely powered by the magic crystals embedded right into it. The dragon quickly grabbed Subaru's attention. Take note of the dragon's eyes and realize that Garfield's quote-unquote stepfather also has the same eye color and the fact that the dragon didn't even try to attack back and seemingly saved us at the end. Subaru's attention after and Crucia's assault on it was way more brutal than what we saw. She didn't hold back even for a second. She even got up close and kicked it right in the chest, sending the dragon stumbling backwards from the sheer- This scene is very funny now because I think that this is like fake spoilers as in the opening is just pumping out bullshit animation to hype people up without spoiling the canon story. But if we assume that the dragon right now is, you know, uh, Garfield's stepdad, you know, he's basically just fighting him right now. Just one-shotting him. Just fucking uppercut. Words from the sheer immense force of it. Now, knowing how this dragon was probably just a human transmutated by Capella, it makes me feel bad for whoever it was before. They mm. probably just wanted help, and Krush just started wailing on them. Yeah, the eye got gouged out too! What the fuck, Krush? Subaru would then discover what the sounds he previously heard on the broadcast was, rendering him speechless in a way that was well highlighted in the anime. What they didn't show after, though, was Capella stomping hard on Krush after being rendered unconscious. Booba. She was convulsing from the mix of blows and whatever Capella had done to leave her like this. Likely poisoned as Subaru could notice a fang-like tooth poking out of Capella's mouth. The moment- That fang is very important. Because Lugunican royals also have a distinct fang with a red eye and a blonde hair. Tooth poking out of Capella's mouth. The moments after were very much faithful to the novel, all the way up to Capella's transmutative counterattack. It was the first time she'd displayed the full extent of her powers as lust. To explain it in the words she herself considers best though, it all stems from the very reason she exists. An existence where all she wants is to monopolize all the world's love and admiration for herself. This in turn makes her the ultimate manifestation of any aesthetic that can possibly exist, and it's through that that- Yeah, her definition of love is pretty much lust, where all the outward appearances, like you don't actually care about Amelia because of her nice, you know, uh, personality, the kind heart that she has, the fact that she saved you and you're comfortable around her and then she's like, no, nah, look at her hair, her pretty face, stuff like that. That is according to Capella and the fact that she can change into whatever she wants. She can be the embodiment of all of those desires that everyone craves because she can just keep changing to whatever people want. And then her keen eyes, Nagatsuki Tapi made a tweet about how she changed into Amelia without even meeting Amelia. I'm like, how does she know that? Well, her eyes, there's like this power where she can kind of understand what the person that she's using her power upon likes and kind of just react and figure that out. This, and it's through that that she alone can answer anyone's most perverse desires. She'll take the form of the most beautiful person according to whoever's tastes, since as the one who deserves to be loved the most. I'm still waiting for, I, I don't think it'll happen, but imagine like, instead of a girl, it just, like, transforms into a man. And ain't nothing wrong with being gay. But it would be a very comical moment where somebody that may be closeted has their true desires shown through Capella and everyone else is like, what the fuck? Are you into these hairy big dudes? He's like, ah, what can I say? She also takes great effort to ensure that she is loved. That's just how devoted she was to receiving it. Such words terrified Subaru down to his core since, as he came to understand it himself, her powers were by far the worst thing possible. They enabled her to violate any and everyone's system of values. So, as something that was being used by someone so morally bankrupt, a horrible conclusion finally dawned on Subaru. Her ability to transmute and transform wasn't just limited to herself. It was a disturbing revelation that finally made everything make sense for him. Mm -hmm. The unnatural buzzing he heard during the broadcast wasn't just the random sounds of insects, it was the transformed People. humans flapping their wings desperately crying for help. I'm gonna assume that the way that everyone turned into flies here is totally different from what she was trying to do with Krush and Subaru because she specifically said, I can't wait to find out what you will turn into, meaning she doesn't know what you're going to turn into if you feed, you know, them with her blood that has that dragon curse in it. How could everyone have just turned 
coincidentally into flies. This probably has to do with like a different mechanic of her power. And we did see like insect larva, eggling, hatchling things on the ground that was replacing where the dead bodies were when Garfield and Mimi were there before getting fucked up by Theresius. So I'm gonna assume that the flies are different transformation stuff. With wings that couldn't even let them fly, it was the only thing they could do given their new inhuman form. So this solidified Capella's position as a villain amongst villains since just like the other archbishops, her twisted nature was simply evil. Very they evil. Wrath toyed with emotions and focused solely on her own self-centered love, Greed forced his values onto others while placing himself above them. Gluttony stole people's names and memories, trampling on their existence. Then Capella simply spat upon the values any normal human knew to respect. And I think that this is pretty obvious by now. And Asaratha really uh, put it into great words. But every one of these archbishops seems to really portray the extreme side of the sins that Subaru definitely can represent at times. She blotted them out in a way that was straight up unforgivable. Now, it was as Capella explained why she did what she did that all the while she'd continue transforming into someone different. It had made Subaru unsure as to who he was even talking to anymore. When it came down to it though, the basis of her logic was Booba. that people can't live without loving someone. Hmm. Since they can't love something that's strange or revolting either though, by process of elimination, it also meant they can't live without loving something they can love. I hate that logic. It's so fucking stupid, bro. Like, of course, if you change something that you love into something fundamentally different, it's not the same thing. That is a dumbass fucking logical argument that you can impose on someone to, like, say, Oh, see? You never loved Amelia. Shut up. By process of elimination, it also meant they can't live without loving something they can love. This was the maxim by which Capella lived her life by. A comprehension of love she referred to as if it was the greatest discovery ever made. And it suits her sin, lust, because lust is not love. Love at first sight, I don't think exists. You can say that like, oh, I saw this girl, I saw this guy, and, and at first eye contact, you know, I knew that it was my soul partner. What the fuck are you talking about? You know nothing about them. You see their outwardly, uh, outward, um, you know, the aesthetics, and you see, you know, good features. Oh shit, they're hot. They're tall. I like their hair color, how they look, blah blah blah. And based on those superficial outward features, which is lust, then you get to understand what they are deep inside, and then love can be formed. But since Capella is lust, right? That's her definition and how she imposes a stupid logic of outwardly appearance. It's totally different. Could you love Amelia if she was a worm? That's, that's, not, that's not fucking love. The whole thing was spoken with reasonably sounding logic, but just like all the other archbishops before her, that logic was built upon pure insanity. Yeah, and it's supposed to be that. Everyone has their own twisted sense of logic based on the sins they represent. It's not supposed to make sense. They were psychotic words that made Subaru just want to run away. Capella wasn't done there though, as she still had more to say with regards to why she was doing everything. To put it as simply as possible, it was all because she loved them. Out of a deranged compassion for everyone around her, that is a crazy line to draw right there. The fact that they just drew that little... This line over here. <laughs> That's crazy. She loved them. Out of a deranged compassion for everyone around her, she in turn wanted to do everything to make everyone love her. It was all part of her desire to drown in the love of many. That was who she was. So, as a person that wanted to monopolize all the love in the world for herself, that meant she needed to put in every effort to be loved. It was a process that included turning herself into whatever image best suited the person she was appealing to. Yeah, and like she thinks that like she can just represent somebody that, you know, the other person loves. And even though like the personality is absolute trash, the outwardly appearance will just make you horny enough and that will be, you know, them loving her back. Her goal was to make everyone look at her, robbing them of their interest in anything else. This, of course, included Subaru too, so even if he was just one person, Lust wanted to make him love her too. It's actually the reason why she refused to kill him here. Mm -hmm. Since all she was about was making people love her, despite Subaru being nothing but a useless sack of meat, he did still have value so long as his love was focused on her. 
That's just how- Wow, Capella doesn't discriminate. How nice of a person she is. How strong her desire for recognition was. So, as far as we know with regards to her motives right now, all Capella wants is for one more person to tell her how much they love her. That was supposedly all she was asking for. Really? Wonder what happens after we do that. Because remember, like when you start, you know, listening to what Regulus is saying, you kind of like listen to him and he kind of like treats you nicer. If we told Capella, I love you, what would she say then? Okay, we're cool now? Now with regards to her motives right now, all Capella wants is for one more person to tell her how much they love her. Okay. That was supposedly all she was asking for. Keeping that in mind then, Capella's next form was a display intended to show just how hard she was working to be loved by Subaru. She then went on a rant comparative to Echidna's back in Season 2, was listing she out every possible reason one might claim to love someone. Yep, it was yep, truly yep. extensive and seemingly unending, each reason changing her expression for the worst the more she continued. In the end, it was all to express how all of it was, well, bullshit, and how to her, the only thing that mattered was visual stimulation. If it didn't, then she was more than willing to put the whole would you love me if I was a fly argument to the test for real. <laughs> it was actually a test Subaru had unknowingly already failed since his disgust for the flies in the other room was stated loud and clear. So this was the logic Capella abided by and the values she decided to pursue as the Archbishop of Lust. Now, fast forward to when Subaru was slowly dying and the tainted blood Capella decided to mix with his started overriding him into something that wasn't him. But we didn't succumb. Krush and Subaru didn't succumb to the dragon blood curse thing, so we're good now? It's just dormant in us? Wonder what the future implications will be since we didn't transform, yet it's still in us. The feeling he felt was no longer pain or agony, but instead fear that originated from a different dimension entirely. Dimension? In this moment, what was happening to Subaru was terrifying. Not because death was right around the corner for him, but instead because death was being withheld from him. Yeah, we can't reset. Like, so many fucked up things are happening right now. It's just like, uh-oh. What if a checkpoint is made? Uh-oh. For the first time, his opponent refused to let him die. That's pretty much where the whole Capella incident comes to an end. So if we were to focus on one of the many other incidents happening- I don't think there is a co- I, I don't think this is a coincidence. Because we're supposed to assume, remember, that the dragon saving us right now is- you know, Garfield's mom's new baby daddy, right? And he left, and as soon as the dragon's leaving, we also see a shot of Garfield looking at them. I feel like it, they're just telling us. Just, they're like, come on. Fucking make the connections. It was told that, you know, the dad was pretty much at the watchtower with the media was. He's gone. But you see the same eye color, and he's trying to help us out. Come on, it's gotta be him. And so, if we were to focus on one of the many other incidents happening across the city, Amelia's capture is probably the best. The others are a bit more disjointed with where they're at, so for them it makes more sense to wait before talking about their stories. So, to focus on Amelia, her initial thoughts here were that she'd been saved by Subaru. She was kind of hoping that that wasn't the case though, since after talking all tough and convincing Subaru she to, to help her him. fight, it would be way too mortifying to know he had to save her anyway. Now, being naked didn't stop her from actually getting up and investigating where she was, since despite Anna Rose's best efforts to make her more reserved, this to her was an emergency. She decided that even if she was completely naked, Anna Rose is trying to make her more reserved? Amelia's wild and out and being a slut. She's not though, she's so innocent and pure. But because she's innocent and pure, I guess, she doesn't really have this like, idea of what is shunned by society and their expectations. Because, like, if you go find people in remote villages, different tribes where civilization hasn't contacted them, they're fine just being completely nude because it doesn't dawn upon them that it's supposed to be something shameful. Similar to Amelia, she's kind of like that, very ignorant, to the point where she doesn't even know what a virgin means. So Ana Rosa, I guess, is trying to, like, enlighten Amelia and kind of educate her, even though she's the one that fucking gaslit her thinking, if you kiss, baby's made. She needed to figure out what the current status was. This led her into the halls with only a blanket on, resulting in her first formal meeting with Regulus, a person she barely recognized as the man she bumped into on the street. She doesn't know he's one of the archbishops attacking the city, nor does she remember him as this person from her past. Fucking bullshit. Why? 
because the source material states that Regulus is such an average, forgettable looking dude, and the fact that this was a year ago in a trial with memories being hazy, I guess it makes sense. Regulus would then approach Amelia similarly to the way Subaru would himself, but the key difference in the way both of them acted was the lack of warmth Regulus carried when he was speaking to her. There was no compassion or consideration behind any of the words he spoke. None of the flattery she would usually receive when Subaru spoke. Yeah, why would we ever flatter an object of desire? To, re like, to Regulus, Amelia is nothing but a pretty luxury purse or high heels or something that's just shown on display and Regulus wants that. I don't think he's even trying to quote unquote like defile her purity. I think she wants to pres I think he wants to preserve it. Which is very interesting because I think right now Regulus and Freya from Danmachi, they're quite similar up until the point where they take their desired ones with without consent, right? And after they've taken them I don't think Regulus is trying to corrupt Amelia's purity, but I think that Freya definitely is. So, it was from this alone that Amelia now had a strange impression of Regulus, leading her to feel like something was deeply wrong. She couldn't quite pinpoint what it was, but something about this man seemed eerily familiar. From a distant corner of her mind, there was this vague feeling that she'd met him somewhere. In any case, there was an uncomfortable intensity with the way Regulus proceeded to ask the question. Are you a virgin? He first grabbed Amelia by the shoulder, brought himself practically face to face, then asked the question he'd asked all his other wives before her. <laughs> the reason for such wasn't- I guess every one of his wives then definitely are virgins. Because like, what if they're not? Would he just kill on the spot? Probably, right? If he's all about just collecting a harm of these pure, innocent- Objects. If you're not a virgin, you're out. I, I think, yeah, I think he was straight up just... Now, would he allow them to live? I don't know about that. He definitely wouldn't allow them to join the collection. But would he kill or just kick them out of the house? I don't know. Out of vulgar curiosity, though, but was rather simply to confirm the sanctity of the powerful bond they were about to commit to. If they were going to embark on a journey of mutual love and Yo, the marriage. then both parties needed to fully entrust themselves. Amelia's wedding dress is looking nice and... Gotta say, Regulus's drip, man. The white-blue color code with his earrings, it really matches well. The color of like white, blue, gold, black, like it's really cool. The drip is fantastic. But we gotta stop this wedding, man. We gotta fucking crash this wedding, man. And I wonder if this wedding will be held at that church-like location that we saw in the opening. Because the wedding is usually held in a church. And in the ReZero Season 3 opening, there is seemingly a structure with crosses kind of hinting that this is a church. I still think that maybe that could be like the witch cult headquarters. Or maybe it's just a random church in Pristella that the wedding's going to be held at. Who knows? I remember vaguely that the color of that church, right? It was very like eerie, like ghost blue colors. And I thought maybe that's like, oh, maybe we're going to Gusteco because, you know, that place in the northern regions, it's like a holy theocracy with churches and religions and shit. ...to each other. It was the only way Regulus believed that they could maintain their relationship. So, with Regulus now closer than he was before, once again, everything about him started stirring the depths of Amelia's memories. His figure, his voice, and his mannerisms all jogged a part of her memory she didn't even know she had. It was a presence almost identical to the menacing feeling she got when facing off against the horde of rabbits. Luckily, Amelia's response was more than acceptable, even going so far as to open- Yeah, it's exceeding. Probably this is the best answer Regulus has ever gotten. This job interview right now, she passed with flying colors. Regulus making this kind of, he was so, so happy. He's like, oh my god, Subarashi, you don't even know what a virgin is, you're perfect. Open up Regulus's third eye for him. What I mean is that Amelia just made it a whole lot more difficult to become one of Regulus's wives now. Before, he'd always used this question as a metric to measure his wife's purity, but now that Amelia had given him an answer he didn't even know was possible, mm. this was the new standard of purity all his future wives would have to live up to. Oh no! <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe death is a better 
outcome than becoming Regulus' wives, though. But, like, the bar has been raised for the new candidates in the future, if there's ever going to be new candidates. Who knows? Maybe Regulus, you know, dies this season. I don't know, but if he continues to go around, you know, collecting wives... Do you know what the word virgin means? That's what he's going to say. He's not going to say, are you a virgin? He's going to say, do you know what a virgin means? <laughs> she it wasn't enough to just be pure physically anymore. No. The For soul. Regulus, their very heart needed to be pure yeah, as well. Yeah, the soul now. needs to be to pure. Know of the concept that he was asking of, well, that would mean that they were just too impure for him. So this was the new standard Regulus had come to accept here. Bro, just fucking... Like, I'll, I'll, I, I guess, like, what, what kind of people could these people possibly be? Like, uneducated, totally ignorant people living away from contact of civilization, far out of the boonies and the fucking mountains, remote islands. Like, like that's, that's the only place where you can get girls like this. Anything else would just diminish the value of the position he was offering. But, yeah. That's everything we missed from episode 5. Thank you, any there news. There wasn't really much in terms of whole entire scenes cut, but I hope these extra details did give you a bit more appreciation for the villains. It was not very nice. I, I wanted more of Gluttony, but I think uh, regular scenes are fucking hilarious. They're extra hilarious to me, not because... Well, the absurdity of the questions he's asking, that definitely adds a comedic effect to it, but thinking about how every other Archbishop right now... And they're, we're like fighting and people are dying and fucked up shit's happening, right? People are getting injured. And then, and then there's Regulus, who's just doing his own thing, <laughs> just wanting a marriage to happen. And it's crazy that the gospel, the orders that everyone's taking from, is demanding this marriage to happen. Like, like you would think that Pandora would be like, yo, get your shit together. You can do this shit in your own time. What are you doing right now? You're trying to get into marriage? But, like, it seems like the marriage is a critical plan to whatever they're doing. Because, you know, the demands now, they said, do not interrupt the marriage. So, who knows, you know, what Pandora's cooking up with regular speeding position that's taking Amelia as the wife. But that's today's episode. Or, sorry, this, that's uh, Anu's review of the cut content for Season 3, Episode 5. Please go check out Mr. Anu's channel. Here's the link, guys. And if you're an Arknights enjoyer, click the link over here. Give him, give him some, you know, sponsor money. Get him the bag. See you next time.